<laughs> well, Dean, thank you so much. Uh, technical problems aside, uh, to sit to talk with me about uh, your fests. I, I caught wind of, of a night of horror. And I was like, ooh, another horror fest in Wisconsin because <laughs> we, 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 we need a few more. That's uh, true. There's a few here. And I saw it was, you know, how long it's been running and that it's been in, uh, you know, in Australia till this year. So, That's true. <laughs> you know, and so I guess, you know, first, uh, if you would by giving my little listeners, uh, uh, my the few that I have, uh, <laughs> they're the background a bit of the fest. W what made you get it started back in, was it 2007? 2006 we launched it in Six, Sydney okay. originally but mm -hmm. yeah the first the first year it ran wasn't 2007 but that was I think March or April of 2007 so we had a big lead in of course mm -hmm. when when I made it I actually the reason we started myself and uh, an ex-girlfriend at the time and my brother and her brother we started the festival because we'd actually made a short horror film and there wasn't really any festival in Australia then particularly that was known to be horror film friendly. But, and so we were like, there's gotta be other people like us who want to screen a horror short somewhere. And so we, that's why it's called a night of horror. And by the time I left Australia, it was an 11 day festival there. I built it up to, but wow. But <laughs> we started as a night of horror and it kept that title because we were going to do kind of like Trop Fest, which is a big mm -hmm. festival in Sydney, a big short film festival, where it's just one night of short films and they play about 16 shorts or a dozen shorts or something. We thought, we'll kind of follow that Trop Fest model. We'll just do one night and we'll, we're going to probably at least get 20 people sending us films. But even in the first year, we were inundated with submissions from all around the planet. And so I felt, as a filmmaker myself, I felt disingenuous just playing like a dozen shorts out of, you know, 100 or 200 submissions. Sure. So we stretched it out over three days. So even the very first year was really three days and nights of horror. And then we got all kinds of requests from people around the planet again because there was nowhere in australia doing this at the time mm -hmm. saying why don't you take feature films like and so originally we were a short festival in fact originally okay. it was called a night of horror short film festival and because we had this inundation of people asking could they submit their features in the second year we opened to features and while we always kept that i suppose loyalty to short filmmakers we always had a big short program mm -hmm. at the festival we became like any international festival primarily a, a feature film festival then and so it grew i think in the second year to five or six nights and then eventually it spiraled out to the 11 it's three here um because it's running parallel with midwest weird fest another festival that i'd already launched here eight years ago in eau claire wisconsin so when i moved a night of horror here i knew my audience at midwest weird fest loved horror and midwest weird fest has a real dedication to horror but we're not just a horror festival we play sure. paranormal cinema and we play offbeat movies and underground mm -hmm. movies and weird wacky comedies and we're it's a very broad tent midwest weird fest and i was conscious that so many of my or so many members of the festival's audience are always keen for horror i thought i could probably bring this run it as its own festival still like have its own program sure. the micon has two screens so i've got two cinemas and if i run them simultaneously at least for the first year and see how we go going forward it'll let our already fairly loyal midwest weird fest audience come and go oh there's this other host festival in night of horror and let's i've just got all these horror films let's dip our toes into that one as well so what made you want to start the Midwest Weird Fest in, in Wisconsin eight years ago? I mean, that, that's kind of a jump from Australia to to here, mid, you know, Wisconsin, the, the top of the Midwest. <laughs> that's true. And I, this, this is my favorite story of the two, actually. I was still running a night of horror in Sydney, Australia at that time, as well as another festival in Sydney called Fantastic Planet, Sydney Science Fiction and Fantasy Film Festival. That's not, that film festival doesn't run at the moment. Um, but I was running those festivals, but I also wanted to run one here in my own kind of neck of the woods. I mean, I'm kind of central northern Wisconsin, and I thought, I wouldn't mind doing a festival here. My mind was kind of playing with different ideas, and I didn't want to do just a horror fest because I was already doing one, although I clearly loved the genre. And then, funnily enough, a few things made me want to do Midwest Weird Fest. A, I wanted to run a festival anyway. And B, I started hearing about how weird Wisconsin was. Like there's, you know, tales of these midget retired circus workers will kill you and Haunchyville oh, yeah. and there's the Bray Road Beast and there's Ed Gein and there's everything from 
the surreal to the actually terrifying. And I read Linda Godfrey's book, um, Weird Wisconsin. We've lost Linda mm-hmm. Godfrey. I actually was fortunate enough to be able to world premiere her feature debut when she came to the festival a few years ago, Return to Wildcat Mountain, which was wonderful. But her book, Weird Wisconsin, and I was reading that. I'm just like, this state I live in is just – and I'm, there's lots of weird books in every state in America, but I just happen to be reading the Weird Wisconsin one. I'm like, my goodness. And then it kind of clicked – you know, Midwest weird fest. fest. And I thought I can do paranormal stuff and offbeat. And I'd always wanted to kind of do an underground film festival as well as not just a total genre based horror based one. I thought this is where I can play those kind of movies. Mm -hmm. So that's how that, that baby was born eight years ago. And I love Midwest weird fest. The mic on downtown you're coming Mm -hmm. is I've worked with lots of cinemas over the last 20 years. It's my favorite cinema. I'm not just saying that because I'm there now. They understand the arts. They're super supportive. It's this gorgeous twin plex. They, it's kind of like an Alamo draft house downstairs sure. where you've got mm-hmm. the even upstairs i think they have a be- benches where you can eat you know your food and you can order drinks and you get them delivered during the movie and the 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 area in downtown Eau Claire, you're probably familiar with it. I wasn't until I started running a festival. It's a gorgeous, it's a college town, so it's yeah. that running for it as well. But it's this gorgeous area which has been restored. They play music on the streets, for goodness sakes, out of speakers. There's all these record stores and bars and antique stores and movie cinemas. And just, it's the perfect place to run a festival. So much so that last year when Mark Polish, who I'd been a fan of for decades since he did <laughs> Twin Falls, Idaho with his brother back in the day, we played a film of his called Murmur as our opening night film and when he came to me he was like this is this is like park city when it was still good meaning sundance of course where he and his brother were discovered all those decades ago and i'm like it kind of is you know it's that kind of before it was crazy popular it's that kind of small town nice small town hip kind of vibe so it's just the perfect place for a first i'm so happy to to have it there. i'm so glad you're coming so you get to experience it (laughs) i am too uh i've i've been involved in a number of a variety of fests over the years since I started covering indie fests. Uh, my my uh, my good friend Glenn he he introduced me back in 2006 actually. Uh, to, well, not 2000. I'm sorry. Uh, it was uh, 11 years ago, so it'd be 2013, 2012 in that area. Uh, John Pata, who's done Black Mold, who did uh, Dead Weight, Pity. He's uh, a Midwest filmmaker, he uh, was running a festival called Oshkosh Horror Fest. And I was like, wait, Wisconsin has a horror film festival, oh, nice. you know? So I, I went to that fest and I I was just, you know, my, my YouTube channel had just been around for like five, six years. And I fell in love with the environment and a few people, so much spawned from that one film fest. I think people don't realize that You know, yeah, you have your big horror hounds in that, but these smaller fests, it was intimate. I got to meet a number of filmmakers and a few of them became great friends. And that led to my group of friends meeting them and spanning out. And, you know, suddenly there's this indie community. I didn't realize that was in Wisconsin. Um, And so it's great that you're bringing another indie horror fest here. Uh, you know, especially this long running one, a night of horror, and then doing the Midwest Weird Fest. I just, I love it. It, it warms my heart to see someone bringing something like that to Wisconsin. So, <laughs> and I agree. I think some festivals can become this magic place for socializing. Something I always prided myself and the festival on with a night of horror is we were so social we were social there wasn't this barrier between different tiers of filmmakers and the audience and festival staff and everybody would go and hang out after the festival in fact the joke back in the day was it was called a night of drinking because it would go right into the night with filmmakers and audience and everybody hanging out and drinking together and midwest weird fest i've I think even in some ways, even more than a night of horror because of the Eau Claire environment, there's a wonderful little dive bar nearby all the audience or a lot of the audience, all the filmmakers are hanging out for that whole weekend. Friendships are made. Films have been made Mm -hmm. because, um, because Midwest Weird Fest, where we have a film this year called The Build Out, which is screening at Midwest Weird Fest on Saturday at 6 PM. The director of that position, Eunice, He'd screened a number of short films with us before. He'd won an award or two at the festival. And the last time he was here with a film, he met Greg Newkirk, who is the star and producer of the series Hellier, among other things. Mm -hmm. And they, I think, struck up a real friendship. And so Greg Newkirk went on. They didn't know each other before Midwest Weird Fest. This is like three or four years ago now. 
Greg Newkirk went on to executive produce the build out. So that's how that movie got made because of Midwest Weird Fest. And over right. the years with both the Night of Horror and Midwest Weird Fest, I've seen many similar relationships happen where people make their next film because of context mm -hmm. they've made one of those two festivals. And I'm sure much like you were talking about in Oshkosh, I think in those festivals where people have a chance to bond in a relaxed and social and very friendly and very genre and film centric environment, all kinds of magic can come out of it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I, I, you know, when I first went to it, I was like thinking fest like horror hound. So I show up and it's a small theater and it's, in, in, you know, and I was waiting for the 50 bucks for an autograph line, or something. <laughs> right. but there's not, you know, just upstairs. It's a, the time, the time community theater in Oshkosh is a, a historic theater run by a community group. They do second run stuff there and that it's similar to the, what you were mentioning with the, the MyCon only this one's had a really long history. It's a single screen. And over the years, the the festivals in their various forms, because it's been under a different number of names, is a fundraiser for the theater. So we do it for nice. the theater. Yeah, I'm and, similar, actually. I give almost all of the ticket proceeds go to the MyCon. I make mm -hmm. no money. Last year, I didn't make a penny from ticketing. But sure. that's okay, because I'm grateful to have that space right. somewhere where I'm able to do this. And I think if you did similar with the Oshkosh one, it, it's fantastic. Because as we as we all know today, it's a harder world than ever for small mm -hmm. cinemas to survive in this space. And I think the future might be more events like the one you were talking about in Oshkosh, and Night of Horror, Midwest Weird Fest, the other various independent festivals around the state bringing a different type of business model to cinemas mm -hmm. that probably mightn't thrive the way they would have back in the 70s or in the 80s right. or in the 90s you know yeah well they it's just hard for them to compete with those multiplexes with the 12 screens and it's like oh okay <laughs> you know, I, I can i can show one of these many movies being released now and even still there's people out there now even with the streaming, people want to go get that theatrical experience, even if it's an older film. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm guilty of it. I literally drove to Wausau from Point uh, to see Dune, David Lynch's Dune, the 40th anniversary on the big screen. <laughs> that would have been great. Yeah, repertory cinema is great when there's a chance to actually mm -hmm. engage in it. Yeah, well, we lost I mean, most of our repertory cinemas in Sydney. Mm -hmm. Like we used to in Sydney, we had the the uh, the Mandolin, we had the Valhalla, and these are the type of cinemas that were also repertory, but they would run the offbeat stuff that we wouldn't get sure. in the big cinemas. So I would see movies like Lair of the White Worm. I saw mm -hmm. something you you posted a video box before with Lair, and I think I saw that at a repertory. Yeah. I saw They Live at a repertory. I saw From Beyond at a rep. Like they were known to do repertory stuff, but they also did the offbeat, you know, horror mm -hmm. releases coming out of America that wouldn't have got on those those big cinema screens and the problem is they are disappearing as i said sydney yeah. lost its two major repertory cinemas yeah well they just they just can't it there is a cost with running them you know and it, and it's one of those things where people don't realize i think the cost in running a, a theater especially like the first run ones uh if you don't have some sort of hook besides just showing the movie it's a struggle for them it really is. And that's why I'm, it's great that you got festivals like a night of horror and Midwest feared fest, and, you know, and the others, there's the Wyoiga international film fest. Uh, you know, there's a Milwaukee has their film fest as well. Uh, that's how some of these small theaters stay afloat <laughs> is these fests, you know, and, and I, I think it's great. You're doing this one. And I saw this lineup. I already got my map worked out for so which bad. which screen i'm going to go to to see which film <laughs> there is some choices there like there's some there, hard choices to be honest it, it was some hard choices i'm like ah do i want to see i'm like yeah but i want to see village incorporated but i'm like ah but you know i've seen bakamoto so, and <laughs> so good by the way villains incorporated is or villains inc is just phenomenal inc, yeah. it's, it's it's hilarious i think they're doing running a kickstarter at the moment to get the money yep. to do their own theatrical run in america mm -hmm. and it's a film that should have a theatrical run that's another thing by the way which is great about festivals i think other than the fact that i think we're both so correct about that they can be an alternative way to for smaller independent cinemas to make money is that the chance of having a theatrical 
run for a lot of films is very small. So in some ways for independent film, a good festival run can be its alternative theatrical run. It might never get picked up and get an actual theatrical, but if it screens at 30, 40, 50 festivals around the world, at least it's been on screens all around the planet. And it's a way that filmmakers can engage with an audience and audiences can see these films rather than having to wait for them to be on, you know, prime or Tubi or something. Right. Yeah. And even there we're seeing where people were jumping on, they're like, Oh, we've got free V and Tubi and that. And all of a sudden news just came out that Amazon's cutting free V. They're going to be. Oh, canceling. I didn't even hear that. Really? Yeah. It, it just came out uh, that they're, they're going to be canceling free V and then Amazon a couple of years ago, uh, two, three years ago now had that great purge of indie films because they weren't, they were paying literally pennies on the hour for, you know, some it's of that. Unbelievable. And I've talked to indie filmmakers who had their films on Amazon and they're like, yeah, it was not worth it anymore because they're like, yeah, no, you're not getting any play. So we're just not paying you. <laughs> yeah, the, the independent film world, I think is one of the few, spaces in any type of productive work and i mean i'm not just talking about creative productive work i'm talking yeah. about any productive work where it's almost like the person who makes the product is expected to make it and never be paid mm -hmm. the amount of horror stories i've heard over the years from independent filmmakers either from a film before they've come through the festival circuit before i met them like before or after right. they've come through the festival circuit with a film i know who just talks tells horror stories about their film being picked up by a sales agent who never paid them. And I've had a, in fact, I, I can say the exact same. I have the same mm -hmm. story. I had a feature that I produced, which was released in multiple continents, physical on two. And I never saw a penny from that movie. And it was on Amazon prime, by the way, here mm -hmm. we, we pulled it eventually because we weren't, in fact, we made the sales agent pull it who wasn't paying us, <laughs> but that's, the, that's the sad story. Filmmakers really are almost expected so just be happy. Well, you spent, you know, three years of your life and half a million dollars or $50,000 or whatever your budget was making this movie, but oh, well, you don't make any money. <laughs> Everybody else does. You don't. the streaming yeah. service does the, the sales agent does the distributor does, but too bad for you, buddy. Mm -hmm. Go back, make another film though. Cause we want to see your next one. I've, I've heard so many horror stories as well about distribution. And there's so many fly by night distribution companies now that if someone i feel bad for up and coming indie filmmakers who are so excited hey i'm going to get my film out on streaming through these guys these are going to give me a great deal and like you said they don't get a dime they don't hear from them ever they've had to make compromises already <laughs> and it's like suddenly their their film isn't their own and they don't know what's happening with it and that's kind of sad with some of this you know because you and i when you're screening the film festival version or whatnot, you're really getting a great quality. And then it gets out to distribution and it's been either edited or just, it doesn't get out there. And it's a shame because there's a lot of talent out there that I think, you know, needs to be seen. Yeah. And the talent gets lost. It's funny when I'm like scrolling through, through a Tubi or through a prime, mm -hmm. particularly in the old days when there was more independent content on prime, the amount of films I would see on there, which I hadn't selected to play at the festival, <laughs> but they're, they're at the same tier on the screening right. level as the films that had often had been selected, unless it became some breakout hit. And you're like your average audience member scrolling through, isn't going to, how's they, how are they going to tell? Well, this film here is absolutely right. fantastic. And this film here, not so good. So there's so much content today that I think the quality can get lost in the noise. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, I think the good thing about film festivals, if they're curated properly, there's a chance for somebody who at least is hopefully a tastemaker's kind of, I guess, facetious, but at least somebody has kind of vetted hundreds of movies yeah. for you and gone, this is really the best of the season crop. Mm -hmm. Like you come here and you can, you don't have to wade through Tubi to hope you get one that's good and you don't have to watch for 10 minutes and turn it off because it's junk. Here, you're probably going to be able to sit here and actually enjoy all the movies. And, and the movies that you have, especially this year, and I was looking at previous years too, uh, great selection. Uh, now, do you watch them all just yourself or do you have a, do you have a group of folks that, that help you decide? <laughs> I, I used to in Sydney have other programmers back sure. in the day and there was dem, there was democratic ways of running it. And to be sure. honest, <laughs> those were all ultimately frustrating. Mm. So today I program both of the, both of the festivals. It isn't that I never, it's not that I don't have some programming consultants, but every film at the festival I've watched the entire film of and every film that didn't make the festival, sure. I always also watched 
the entirety of. And I think it's important. There was a big festival recently, maybe the biggest in America. We don't need to name names, but there was a scandal, which I already could have told you, mm -hmm. is that the films weren't being watched or a big portion of the films right. weren't being watched. And the way you can tell that is if you look at some of the big midnight movie programs attached to the major non-genre festivals, and again, we don't have to name them, you can trace why those films are playing. Oh, that's um, <laughs> this, it's this director's second or third movie, yep. or maybe his fifth or sixth or 10th movie, you know, what he's mm -hmm. already a genre star. Or, oh, okay, this was already owned by Lionsgate, or this was already, you know, by this distributor, or the, here's the, you know, this guy won an award two years ago, mm -hmm. or whatever. You can always, you can almost look at that program and trace every one, and you know none of them came through as blind submissions. So there, I think there's a disingenuity to some festivals that literally take in thousands of films mm -hmm. and screen what percentage of that from yeah maybe less well, than one percent. I mean, mo almost it, the entire programs of both of my festivals at the moment that I run, almost the entire program of each were blind were blind submissions. Mm -hmm. There might have been one. There might be one or two features in there which weren't the blind submission process. But there's so much great blind submission stuff. I don't know why you have to go out there to <laughs> to to get something else when your when your yeah. desk is overflowing. Mm -hmm. It's like why would I be going and sourcing a film from a sales agent or from somewhere else where there's this wonderful independent film that paid to submit to the festival, which is fantastic and should have played Sundance and didn't. Right. Why am I going to go and just hunt down the one that played Sundance? So I'm like a Reader's Digest version of, you know, every midnight movie program in a top tier festival. doesn't make any sense. No, they'll, they'll pick it just because it has this star or it'll go through, you know, people wonder. And, and, and I learned this over the years covering films, the film fest and that of why, like for some films, the first five or 10 minutes are fantastic and then you got a little bit of a lull in there before it picks up and then it was like well that's because many people either the fests or distributors only watch the first five to ten minutes of the film and if it doesn't catch them they just move on yeah and they buy it on poster art or on trailer mm -hmm. or on the names which are on there do you know what mm -hmm. i mean if you go yeah. if you've ever been to like a, a film market mm -hmm. like can for example when you walk through the actual the market area and there are people literally selling films there's just there's distributors and buyers from around the world wandering around it almost like you'd wander around a supermarket you know what i mean they're going oh yeah. i'll have danny treo's in that one he sold well sure. after the last film or oh you know lesbian vampires are cool let's get by that film <laughs> like literally yeah. they, these films yeah. are being bought on poster and on trailer yeah. and then the names which are above the line because they know when they take them back to their territory they can sell them based on that. And that makes sense as a business model, but it doesn't make sense as a model that reflects mm -hmm. the quality of independent cinema. Right. And and that's the thing is quality of independent cinema. Uh, you know, it's it's got a stigma. I mean, you, you, you probably run into it. You know, you say, well, independent film, there's a stigma, this pre-notion, especially for those who may not watch a lot. And it, yeah, sometimes it takes a little... Uh, adapting to the aesthetic of say they didn't have a budget for a full effect, but I've found a lot of talent and directing and editing and the storytelling, even if the production value wasn't that high, how you find the same thing. <laughs> I'll be honest. I find an increasing level of production value since mm -hmm. I've been doing that or doing this. And I think what's happened is there's also an increasing amount of rubbish. There's an increasing mm -hmm. amount of both because yes. we talked about, I, I remember when I first became interested in filmmaking properly. I mean, I was always interested in filmmaking since I was a kid running around my dad's super eight and then family sure. video cameras. But when I, when I first thought I might do this somewhat of a professional level, there was talk about the democratization of technology. And now you could, get final cut pro and you could get mm -hmm. like um what was the camera then like a canon xl1 yep. or an xl1s mm -hmm. and this thing which kind of mimicked you know film look but it was still you know just standard deaf video really right. and there was this idea oh because you know 28 days later was shot on this camera or this film was shot and i can make it because that one film which was a hollywood film but the, the reality is the democratization of technology has really only hit the last probably five years now mm -hmm. you can buy like a canon m70 for example sorry canon c70 
which can shoot a film which looks like something you would see in a cinema as far as yeah. image quality goes, lens mm -hmm. quality, image quality. And you can buy that for the same price as these old prosumer cameras, mm -hmm. that were, were, which were kind of sold, marketed by Sony and Canon and Panasonic that you could go out there and make real feature films. And I so I think today there are filmmakers who are able to make films that look really good. Mm -hmm. And if they're smart and they cast well, and Lord knows there's more actors who want to break into this industry properly oh, yeah. than you could even think about. <laughs> yeah. If you cast well, and if you're tech, if you're technically savvy, and if you can tell, I mean, there's a, it's my, I'm making this sound easy because it isn't. If you have a good story and you can direct your actors well, you can afford to do it now in, in the current technological space for far less than you could have like 50, 60, 70 years ago. Like there's just mm -hmm. no way you would have been able to pull off as easily cinema or for the same kind of budget as you could pull right. off cinema now. So I see movies like this year we're screening. Um, one of the films we're screening at Midwest Weird Fest is a call is a film called uh, called Last Weekend. Mm -hmm. And that film, when I when I watched that movie, and it's a kind of a noir thriller um suspense type movie directed by curtis anthony williams and Co he wrote it with his actress i think virginia rand and virginia rand's performance in that film is probably the most powerful female performance i've seen in years like i'm not i'm not exaggerating yeah. she yeah. literally should have won yeah. the academy award this year or next year for it <laughs> i think it played cinequest like it played it played a decent festival mm -hmm. but it should already be a darling on the festival circuit it should have played sundance I mean, mm -hmm. it's that kind of film that, sh but the problem is there's so much competition, but it's not even yeah. that. It's the, what we talked about before that films aren't even watched properly by some major festivals right. and we want a name on there, or there's a reason we've got a relationship with a sales agent or a distributor. So a film like last weekend, which anybody who watches at the festival will go, yeah, this should have played Sundance. This performance <laughs> by Virginia Rand, I've, I, I, I haven't seen anything like this on yeah. The, on the big screen or on Netflix recently, like it's such an incredible film, but it's films like that can slip through the cracks. And over the mm -hmm. years of doing this, I've seen, I've, I've been embarrassed to world premiere films. Sure. And I thought this shouldn't be world. <laughs> and I'm not world premiering last weekend, yeah, like I just said, but I, I, I'm world premiering films this year as well, which should have yeah. opened larger festivals than, than mm -hmm. are playing here and it's because there's so much content and there's also a lot of disingenuous higher tier festivals to be honest yeah yeah no i i i, I totally can see that i mean uh you know all the ones that i've been in it, that we always try to stay true to the indie spirit you know and in fact uh, a lot of times focusing more on midwest to where while the quality may not be as high as say another submission it's got a lot more heart and it's from Wisconsin. So, we, you know, sometimes that may lean into if it's if they're, if they're the same weight as far as what people agree on. You're like the Wisconsin one might weigh out a little bit more because, you know, we're in Wisconsin. You're trying to focus, you know, bring a focus to attention to this talent that normally wouldn't get an opportunity. And I mean, it's not like, you know, journalists are showing up all the time, you know, the big, big nationwide journalists are showing up at the fests. Right. But like you said, it's just getting out to people because it all it, artists want to have their stuff seen <laughs> and, and hopefully maybe even appreciated and any opportunity that they can get, even if it's in the sm front of a small, group they seem appreciative and it, there's just this stigma i think of people oh well it's indie i don't want to watch it and i'm like you're missing out on some fun stuff mm -hmm. like uh fang i don't know if you're familiar with fang uh richard burgeon out of chicago came out with fang it stars lynn lowry in one of her best performances I haven't i've seen i've ever seen oh, wow. uh it's it's a small budget film uh and it's about a, a guy who's slowly going crazy, who's dealing with his mom who has Parkinson's. And it's it's uh, he based it basically as far as some of his experience off of real life stuff. But it's amazing. It's just this amazing little film that, you know, people might be turned off because it may not have the highest production value. But Lynn Lowry is is phenomenal in it. And it's like. Holy, you know, why aren't more people <laughs> seeing this? And they're, they're the kind of things you can find at a festival, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I love the idea of every year when 
uh, when and they always do audience members come up to me and there's a particular film that just grabbed them and maybe not the same for every person who comes up right. to me mm -hmm. and it's so rewarding to have thought okay well this audience member has got to connect with this film and often this filmmaker because we have most of the most might be an exaggeration but a, a very large chunk of feature films represented at the festival. Like mm. if you come to the festivals on Friday night, there's six films, there's five films right. playing, but three of those films have the feature filmmakers there to represent, including um, a filmmaker from the UK, Craig Tui, who we actually have the sneak peek screening. It can't officially be the world premiere because that's already happening at another festival after us, but it's a sneak peek screening of a film um which is absolutely it's just it's just phenomenal and he for example will be there to q a so if the audience responds to his film the way that i suspect the audience will respond to his film mm -hmm. then he'll have that immediacy with the audience as they will too not only will they get to have been the first people on the planet to have seen and it's called everyone is going to die it's this ah, wonderful okay. home invasion movie and it's the production value is fantastic the performances are amazing the twists are just phenomenal and not a, not only will they go oh i was one of the first people on the planet to see the film they got to engage with the director and he got right. to watch an audience watching his film for the first mm -hmm. time and that's the type of magic that happens and then that person walks away with a cinematic memory that mm -hmm. you can't get from Netflix or you can't get at a Stan and Marv MCU movie when you go to the Megaplex. You've discovered something you might never have discovered. You're mm -hmm. one of the first people to see it on the planet and you got to listen to the director do a QA and a and then talk to him in the foyer or have a beer with him next door in the dive bar. And that's what festivals at the indie level can offer. That It's an experience you just can't, you can't even get that experience at a major large festival. Like right. go to Cannes, like I'm I mean, you might have been to large festivals. The, the biggest fest I've probably ever been to is Cannes. I've never been to mm -hmm. Sundance, by the way. I need to get there one year. Um, but you don't have that experience. Hey, you might bump into people and it's fun and it's a great party and everything else, but you don't have the chance of connecting with every filmmaker that you saw at the festival. You just don't get that opportunity. You might bump into one or two if you're lucky, but at an independent film festival, you can have a proper long lasting conversation with the filmmakers there. And for them, they get an immediacy that they don't get at these other festivals. So it's a win-win. And I think that's the joy of a film festival. To me, at least the greatest joy is introducing a filmmaker to their audience and letting both of them have an experience mm -hmm. that they wouldn't get if they played anywhere else or if they watched it anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, when I was part of uh, Twisted Dreams, uh, I went to the Twisted Dreams Fest in Milwaukee. Oh, nice. Um, I know I, those Chris, guys. Christopher Kai. Yeah. They, uh, yeah he's a great guy. They, they ended up, um, uh, it was for an award. I, I, they were awarding, giving me an award out of Wow. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was the backbone of Wisconsin horror. It's an actual spine. And, uh, That's raccoon. fantastic. And they put an eye at it or anything. Wow. It, it was just out of the blue. I, I judged one of the first fests and I hadn't heard from them too much because they had grown really big in that. But I went down there and my wife actually went with me. Now she doesn't watch the same films I do, but she was <laughs> she was very kind and she she sat through these, but she got to meet Lloyd Kaufman because Lloyd Kaufman was there at the nice. after party. They're talking about Shakespeare and she's like because they had just seen Shakespeare shitstorm which she she actually sat through with with me I I looked at her and I'm like you don't have to she's like no no we're doing this we're doing this and uh she ended up you know we're in the we're in the bar the after party and suddenly she strikes up a conversation with Lloyd about Shakespeare Incredible. and it's like you know and, and I'm talking to other indie filmmakers and such and like you said it is it, these smaller fests shouldn't be overlooked because not only do you get to see talent on screen, but you get to meet the talent and you've, yeah, this lineup. I mean, how many submissions did you get for a night of horror? I, we Well, normally a night of horror, the submissions were only open for three months this year because I okay. moved it relatively quickly from Australia to here. Normally sure. it would be open for closer to 10 months. Oh, so okay. this year is probably not an accurate reflection of a night of horror because mm -hmm. it was literally a third. We still got a couple hundred, but it was small, but Midwest mm -hmm. Weird Fest got several hundred as it has for a number of years now. Wow. So between the two festivals, there was probably around 900 submissions. Mm -hmm. Which is a wow. lot of cinema. Yeah. That's, that's that's a lot of cinema. I, I've, 
uh as you said uh, uh don't mind me bringing it up i i've been i've been there i because i've been judged on a number of fests over the years and some of those fests uh you get hundreds of submissions and pretty soon after a while you're like oh man i gotta take a break <laughs> it's just, it's so many uh, of various as you said various degrees and the production value in general has gone up I mean, I think every indie filmmaker in the world is happy about drones now. Right? It's almost overdone now, you know, like <laughs> the, almost... the, am the amount of movies, and I'm sure I've played some, but the amount of movies that start with like a forest shot or yes! like going up a road, going over a forest, it's, it's, it's staggering. And this, but it was cutting edge when people started to do it because right. every filmmaker, and I can't talk because there's a film I produced where there's a shot very much like that at the beginning. <laughs> but <laughs> but particularly early on, every filmmaker had dreamt of having that helicopter shot yeah. or that. And all of a sudden, yeah. oh, I can get this DJI drone or whatever. Oh, now I'm, <laughs> now I'm, you know, I've got like that opening to The Shining, you know, like I'm traveling the car through the mountain pass or something. And so it was very attractive. Now it's, it's getting to the stage now where it's like, I almost don't want to see a drone shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I I noticed that trope too, and especially it usually is over a woods. It's it, it for some reason it oh seems gosh. to be over a forest at some point, a road and a forest, and yeah. you're just like you you've got to double check sometimes. That, <laughs> wait, did I click on the wrong movie? Oh no, wait, no, no, we're here. And, but like, I mean, it, but it's great that those tools are there. I mean, absolutely. I absolutely. I just saw on Amazon for. I mean, it is a higher end for your your budget, but still, you could get a full steady cam vest for your film for like three hundred and fifty bucks. Oh my goodness! Like that's it, it's that's yeah. cheap. Goodness gracious! It, and it wasn't even like a Timu or a Wish type thing. No, this was an actual like Amazon regular listing. It was like three hundred some odd dollars wow. for this, and they showed the rig, and I'm just like that's just crazy it's like we've come full circle because in the 70s you had indie filmmakers using the same tools as the big studios you're shooting on film you're using the same equipment and then video cameras came along and suddenly indie filmmakers went to that because film was expensive but then the quality dropped but mm -hmm. now we're back again to the pro and amateur pro am equipment yeah. being the same stuff now affordable and that's probably one of the reasons we see production levels rise, even in very independent films. Something I find funny now, though, and I like it, to be honest, is films that are shot to capture that crappy video aesthetic. You know, like it's like, I'm going to make this look like it was shot on a handy cam in 1992. That's a thing now. And it's kind of cool. And you watch, and you go, this is really, but at the time when you were shooting on that stuff, or at least I was, you were conscious, this is a bit crap. <laughs> you know, this doesn't look like Indiana Jones or this doesn't look like, you know, whatever I'm trying. This doesn't even look like John Carpenter's Halloween, you know, because you were conscious of the, the difference. But now there are filmmakers who use that sometimes just as part of the story, but sometimes right. as a whole film. And there, if, when it's done well, it actually works really well. And now mm -hmm. it's funny to go, this aesthetic I used to hate because I was trapped in it myself. Now I look back on it. It's like, oh, those were the happy days. <laughs> Crappy video. <laughs> Crappy video. I run into that even with my, my YouTube. I mean, when I first started, we're talking 2006, when I first started doing videos, I had a Sony Handycam and I, listen, I watch those old videos now and I go, man, I wish I could take that tape noise out of there because you can hear the tape. <laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah it's i mean you know i'm happy that we we have all these fests and there is a lot of stuff you have to weed through i think you, we both agree we're not saying every indie film is a gem i've seen some doozies to where i've, I'm like, I've seen some doozies at the box <laughs> at the, at the mainstream the cinema yeah. made by hollywood man as well so <laughs> <laughs> right and, and that's the thing is you see them in both nowadays so uh, I think the only thing that maybe helped indie films a little bit and uh, is uh, COVID and the pandemic. Now, uh, I imagine you had to put the fest on hold during uh, the, the heights of the pandemic, even though Australia was doing really good during most of it. <laughs> yeah, during in a night a night of horror during COVID, I, I actually for three years I well. 
I still, I suppose, oversaw the festival. I didn't run the festival. It was still my intellectual oh. property. It was still my festival. Yeah. I, I was still, when I first lived here, I went back for a couple of years to keep running it like I used to. But as my daughter grew older, it just became more difficult to, sure. you know, how do I leave my two-year-old and go, or how can I take her? So I had other people who were involved with the festival run it there for a few years. And I do believe they had to postpone and they had some issues here with Midwest Weird Fest, though. We, we, the Midwest Weird Fest just before COVID, we came under just under the kind of under the panic or under the pandemic. And so much so that people were joking about it at the festival still. It was like March, you know, at first weekend in March, people we were going, Oh, I might have COVID. Ha ha ha. The next year, <laughs> yeah. the next, I'm like, I'm going to shake your hand. You came in from New York City. Ha 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 ha. Like it was a joke then before the paranoia of a month later where you really wouldn't have shaken somebody's hand. Right. Yeah. But, um, but the next year, while uh, there was still, you know, COVID restrictions mm -hmm. to a degree in place, particularly probably in Eau Claire, which had more restrictions than, say, the county I live in. But um, we still ran the festival. We ran it at a reduced mm -hmm. numbers. I think we only would sell half of the cinema that year. And mm -hmm. I think the staff were doing additional cleaning protocols. And there was, you know, right. there were mask restrictions inside like there were, I think, in most of, of the county that the festival's in. But we still, we never had to pause, which was great. We got through, we, we snuck under one year and the second year there were restrictions. And by the following sure. year, there were no restrictions anymore. So thank you. Goodness, we never had to pause Midwest Weird Fest because I know a lot of festivals around the world stopped that year. They either went we did, online yeah. or they just, you know, they just weren't yeah. doing it this year. Yeah, we we did. We paused it, and then the next year it was a curated limited fest. So we we kind of instead of submissions, we did kind of a curated. I uh, gotcha. From uh, past submissions uh, that didn't quite make the previous fest. They were good enough. They just there was a choice between one or the other, and they didn't. So we approach those filmmakers and and put it together but the last couple of years now we're doing uh submissions again for oh nice uh the fest so because the fest in Wisconsin in Oshkosh has gone under a number of different names changed hands a number of times and I've just been fortunate enough to be able to work in some fashion with all of them uh, I need to try to get along one of these years to the festival Oh, which one? Sorry. No, to your to the one in oh, Oshkosh. Yeah. Yeah. No, we we we're uh, it's second weekend in October. It is so good time of the year, Halloween. Um, lead lead yeah. up to the Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh and, and I hope you just uh, you don't mind me share it. It's just that I I it's I don't get to talk to a lot of people who who handle fests. So it's 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 uh, great to hear about your experiences and Again, this lineup is is just impressive that you have. Uh, what are some year. standouts for you? What are some things that are really uh, catching well? Your I was fortunate enough to uh, in, I got independently connected to uh, Bakimono, uh, and that one is oh, that's got to look great on the screen. Yeah, hey, I'm because, looking forward to screen that because that's that one with the uh, uh, you know practical effects, and they were creepy. Just and it's a out. Japanese, yeah, it's a Japanese monster movie, but with all practical effects. Yeah, so. and not a monster movie like Godzilla, or a monster movie like no. Hellraiser, or something. You know, like there's this like creature, and it's preying on people. And and, and the demon designs are wonderful. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, as I mentioned, Villains Inc. is what I'm looking forward to ever it's since so I learned of it. It looks oh so gosh, good. It's so good, it is. It was um, it, when when you program, as you probably know, there are films that sometimes you've got to give them some time before you make the decision, but there are films yeah. within the first like minute, you still watch the whole film before you, you lock it <laughs> like, in. But yeah. when you're like, there's no doubt I'm not screening this film. And villains was one of those movies that like, I, I it would have been under five minutes. I was like, I have no doubt this film's going to be screened. <laughs> and I wasn't disappointed as I watched the rest of it. So. Right. And, and the, you do get a few of those to where you you're watching the first few minutes. You're like, Oh, I'm awesome. This is going to be great. And then by the end of it, you're like, well, maybe. Yeah. I'll tell you a I'll tell you a quick funny anecdote you might like. Yeah. And this is why festivals are disingenuous who don't watch the whole film. Years ago in Sydney, we had a film submitted. It was a short film, and it was in it was made to intentionally look like the filmmakers got better as they went along. And it was only a short, like 10, 15 minutes, sure. maybe not mm -hmm. even 15, probably yeah. 10. So at the beginning it was like handy cam, just nonsense. Mm -hmm. Like I, you're watching going, this is just your thing. And there's no way I'm going to screen this. And then I think they go, Oh, now we've bought this and it got a little bit better. And by the end it was literally like star Wars. Like that was yeah. the gimmick of the film. Like the filmmakers wow. getting better and yeah, better and yeah. better. But if you'd watched that film for two minutes you, and you, you, and you just mm -hmm. ignored it, you would, you never would have played it. And then you never would have seen this 
this incredible arc. So that taught me a lesson early on is that you never turn a film off because there might be a surprise in there. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, I would have missed that if I'd zoned out <laughs> after the first couple of minutes. Yeah. And, and I always say that, you know, even if a film starts out weak, if it ends strong, you're still going to remember, remember it and probably think of it as a decent film unless rather than going the other way. Cause if it starts strong and ends weak, that's kind of the last thing you remember about the film. And so if it ends on like a really solid, like, memorable action piece or whatever horror piece you're like actually that wasn't so bad <laughs> it's true. i do think for filmmakers though i think it's it's the same for screenwriters and for filmmakers and while i gave mm -hmm. that exception and i actually bothered to sit through it i think it's important to capture your reader or your audience very quickly mm -hmm. and when i say your audience i mean the sales agent or the festival curator sure. or mm -hmm. whatever i think you need something to grab them by the throat particularly in today's very short attention span kind of culture, but mm -hmm. you need to really grab at the beginning. And that doesn't have to mean that somebody has to be shot in the head or there has to be, you know, there has to be something, although that mightn't be a bad idea depending on the genre, but there has to be something very early on, I think, which grabs people's attention in this mm -hmm. busy world where in West, people are on their phone and they're also on their computer and they're probably watching your movie if they're a sales agent or a programmer. So I, I, if, if there are any filmmakers listening, I would give that advice. Do something up front that makes you want to watch the next 10 minutes. I think I read somewhere once that like the first, and there was some, I think sales agent or some buyer was saying something like, you know, the first one minute buys you the next three minutes, which buys you the next seven minutes, which oh, buys mm -hmm. you the 15 minute sure. mark, which will get you to the half hour. So you've kind of got to make sure, and that's terrible. And that is probably a, a failing of co the commercial reality of the world, but I think it applies yeah. to film festivals as well. Another thing in case there are any filmmakers listening, I always like to give this advice for free is if you're making a short film, make it short. That doesn't mean it has <laughs> to be in it. But if you want to make a 30 minute, I've played plenty of 30 and 45 minute shorts over mm -hmm. the career of programming, but they've been like the citizen cane of shorts. They've been like as good, if not better than the features I'm playing. Right. So I can't ignore them. I had a wonderful 24 minute short this year. I mean, spectacular. And I just couldn't fit it into the program. Right. And it really bothered me that I couldn't fit it because there were other films of that length, which might've fit the program better. And then if you're a programmer and say it was just as rounded out to 30 minutes, if you're a programmer and you're, you've got four films and you've got 30 minutes to fill left and three of them are 10 minutes and one of them's 30 minutes and you like all of them the same. What are you going to do as a programmer? Right. You yeah, program the three 10 minute films, right? Three 10 minute films. Yeah. I mean, it's a short, it's a short block. So people are expecting that. You're not expecting exactly. that. A longer film uh so you know and i i love shorts i've reviewed shorts on my youtube channel when i don't see a lot of people do and i've even had some people comment on it because i think shorts there's oh, just nice. as much work that goes into a short as there is a feature film i mean it's maybe not as long but it's still like preparation and prep work and all of that still goes into it and some of them are just like you're just floored 10 minutes you're like wow that's a story you just told a nice, lean, interesting story that held my attention from like start to finish. <laughs> you know, I like those more than the two and a half hour indie films where someone should have had an editor look <laughs> at it and go, you know, <laughs> that's another thing, too. Yes, yeah, some filmmakers find it difficult to kill their babies, as they say, like yeah. you have to. There are films I regularly see and some of them I even program, but there are films I see which are, you know, two hours, which could have been 80 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. difficult sometimes, I think, when you're there, if you've been the person, particularly if it's a director slash editor or a director yeah. working very closely with an editor and the director's mm -hmm. more dominant. I think it's very hard for you to think, well, I spent, you know, a whole day getting that one shot and it might not even work, but it's very difficult for you to emotionally separate from it mm -hmm. and get rid of it. But yeah, that that can be a problem independent feature films which are way too long and also independent shorts that are way too long that said right. you should check out some of the short programs if you can midwest oh, has plan, four it, this year and i, I saw that i saw that i'm like very oh, dedicated i gotta the shorts yeah i gotta i gotta work it in there some way because i saw the program list and like yeah no i want it definitely the midwest shorts for sure i want to catch uh it's just that you you've got it's double build uh, which I'm glad you do have a shared screening for some of these films uh, that's going to be showing for both fests, because then I don't have to have to flip a coin between them. I mean, you're opening with what Blind Cop 2. It's fantastic. Alec Bonk's film is incredible. I mean, this is a theatrical world premiere. They they screened um, 
at um, another hole in the head, I think, but it was virtual. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first. And so they've never done a theatrical. So nice. it's the first time they've done a theatrical, which will be amazing. That's opening. And yeah, closing night is Bloody Bridget, which is just. Right. And, <laughs> and they submitted to both festivals, actually. So they were the perfect. <laughs> they were both the perfect opening and closing night movies. And then I, and I thought, what better way to bring the two festivals together at the beginning? So everybody gets a sense, oh, there are two festivals here and there's commonalities, but there's differences. And at the end, to bring everybody together for the big <laughs> finale and then the big after party. So, you know, the audiences can join. And the only other shared screen, you're right, but it, we've still got another film screening and the other one at the time is the Midwest. Mm -hmm. the best of the midwest shorts program because that was the best from both the night of horror and from um from midwest weird fest which mm -hmm. was made in the midwest and like you i do like to be able to um encourage filmmakers who are who are regional as well so that was the purpose of that short session not to say it's not an incredible session because it is the amount of talented filmmakers in the midwest weird fest is phenomenal and it's so lovely and refreshing to see movies that, not that I, I love movies made on the coast as well but it's so wonderful to see films that aren't mm -hmm. to see a different flavor of films that are made away from those kind of influences and with different looks and with different regional tastes so yeah that shorts program is a lot of fun you'll enjoy that there, and it's just a different approach to storytelling because it's a different environment these filmmakers grew up in so it's always fun to see that <laughs> you know a lot yeah. of farm a lot of farmland stories you know yeah, there are really, it can be a lot of those <laughs> they give you a, i live in the middle of that area though so now all of those things i'm like oh this is like this is appropriate to me <laughs> but i i do like the midwest ones because then occasionally i'll i'll spot a location i've been at so uh like i was watching night of the living bread and that oh, was nice. from some filmmakers from steven's point and my oh, wow. house and car were actually in a back shot because they shot at the we live across the street from a cemetery and so they shot the film part of it in the cemetery across the street so I, they, they caught my car and house oh my goodness fantastic <laughs> so, yeah i'm watching it for screening it and i'm like that looks familiar <laughs> i'm like wait a minute <laughs> That's fantastic. So, so that's why I, I like the Midwest stuff too. And and yeah, and your weird fest. And it's hard. You made it hard though, running them both for being a film lover that I am. I'm like, I need to clone myself because I want to see both full programs. <laughs> Oh, I, I bet. I, I, I like that though. I like giving people or forcing people to make a choice. Like you have to make a choice. Do you want to see the UFO documentary or do you want to see the shorts? Do you want to see the violent body horror or do you want to see the comedy? You know, like make a decision. I think one of the, the, the most refreshing things I enjoy is when you see a an indie anthology movie released and you look at the shorts, I had one where I was watching it and I recognized like five of the six shorts from a fest. And I'm oh, like, wow, that was amazing to me. I'm like, this seems familiar. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen that. And then the next short played. And I'm like, I've seen this one. too. <laughs> yeah, that that's a, that's a thing now. Mm -hmm. I actually think I think I was one. I probably wasn't the first, mm -hmm. but I think we were one of the first people to do that back in. Mm -hmm. Was it 2014 when we? produced a night of horror volume one where we took some of the best um shorts from that festival myself and enzo tedeschi who's a very well-known australian producer in this kind of space and then enzo shot a wraparound with um oh, with nice. the with um with the lead actress from wormwood the, the mm, you know mm -hmm. the, so she yeah. she was in bianca was in in the wraparound so this wonderful wraparound which fit the stories and then they were able to get actual related props from the movies which we had and insert them in there and it worked really well and so I think, yeah, I, I know other people have done it, but I think we were one of the very first. I know there was a Cthulhu one which had done it before us because I'd seen that submitted to a festival years before. But I think we were one of the first to have actually have gone, how can we do this really well? And I think we pulled it off great. I think if you watch Denied a Horror Volume 1, not that you can in this country because we had problems with <laughs> with sales issues sure. and distributor issues, so we pulled it. But um but it actually played like a proper anthology. Like, I don't mm. think you would have gone, oh, this was a bunch of shorts. Although you might have, like you, if you'd been to festivals and you'd seen all of these movies. <laughs> well, I, I, being a judge, I, I had bl bl blown through a lot of shorts and I'm like, I just recognized almost every single one. And it was, it was, it, it was great though. Cause I'm like, this is good. Cause they were all really good shorts. And I was happy that people were out there seeing them. So, 
Uh, but yeah, uh, this has been great, Dean. I know you've got uh, other things scheduled for tonight. It never at this time of the so, year. It never. This, I could I could not sleep, and I still wouldn't have enough time at oh, this time of the year. I I can fully I can fully understand that. But I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to you and getting to meet you. Uh, and uh, I appreciate it quite a bit. And yeah, uh, opening uh, is six o'clock Friday, the March first, and you That's go. Correct. And Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then you end uh, with Bloody Bridget, which I'm that poster alone for Bloody Bridget. I'm like, oh, that looks amazing. It's, it's uh, so good, Richard Elfman. You know, Richard Elfman actually like founded Oingo Boingo, mm -hmm. the Danny mm -hmm. Elfman, and Danny Elfman, of course, is his brother. So Richard Elfman is the director. Richard Elfman appears in a specific role, which I won't spoil for audience members. Sure. But Anastasia Elfman is is the lead, and um, some of Danny Elfman's music is in the film as oh. well. So for anybody who's a fan of um, of the Elfmans at all. It's, yeah. That alone is worth catching this film for. So it's a perfect film to end, to end out the festivals. And I love I love ending a festival on a high note and then everybody feels like, well, we'll go to the bars or whatever. What do you do? <laughs> Have a Coke if you don't drink. But um, it's always a it's always a high energy uh, finale at Midwest Weird Fest. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Dean. Folks, I'll put this uh, links to both fests down in the body of this podcast. And uh, I look forward to meeting you. Hope at the fest, uh, catching you. you. I, I know you'll be uh, running around, but I appreciate this and thank you for your time very much, sir. Oh, thank you, man. We'll sit down. I don't know if you drink or not. We'll have a coffee if you don't, or we'll have a beer if you do, but we'll, we'll, um, yeah, we'll hang out at the fest for sure. And thank you so much for having me on. It was a great fun chatting to you and I can't wait to hang out at the festival. Fantastic. So check it out, folks. Come on, come to Wisconsin. Uh, we've got beer, cheese and horror and weird films, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> can't ask for more than that.